All right. Um, I think we should go ahead and get started. First off, thank you all so much for joining us on this webinar. My name is Jamie Berryhill. I'm with the OECD's Observatory of Public Sector Innovation. Uh, and we are here today to talk about our latest work on surfacing public sector innovation trends uh, in partnership with the UAE's Mohammed bin Rashid Center for Government Innovation. Um, so I'll walk through a few slides, but just to give you a sense of how this will go, uh, I'll provide a, a few remarks over some slides about the work, and then I'll pass it to our partners, uh, uh, our partner Abir, to talk about um, our partnership and the upcoming World Government Summit. Uh, and then we have four speakers today that I'll introduce in a bit that'll provide you some uh, presentations on the actual innovation projects that they are working on. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. And um, just as a, a heads up, if you have any questions, um, there should be a chat or a Q&A uh, option to leave those questions. The agenda is very tight, so we'll try to get to those questions at the end. But if we have some that we didn't get to, uh, we're going to take those questions down and save the chat and then work uh, with the speakers today to, to get you answers to those. And we'll respond to the, the participants uh, through an email. Um, but just a little bit of background on this. Since 2016, OPSI and the Mohammed bin Rashid Center for Government Innovation have worked together in partnership on a series of reports on public sector innovation, uh, resulting in 11 different reports so far, um, which has been a, a really exciting process coming uh, over the years, seeing you know, little pockets of innovation uh, scale up and, and go into more systemic and more technologically advanced levels in, in a fairly short period of time. Um, and we're really excited to launch our 2023 trends report at the World Government Summit in Dubai, uh, which will be taking place from uh, February 13th to 15th. Uh, as part of this work, we have two really core inputs that, that, um, that, that fueled this work. Uh, each year, we've held a global open crowdsour crowdsourcing exercise called a call for innovations. Um, which surfaced 714 different cases uh, from all around the world this year, uh, from 94 different countries, and we supplemented that with 370 cases that we found on our own through our own research. Um, so uh, almost 1,100 cases really went into kind of surfacing and, and synthesizing this year's trends. Uh, we would just first of all like to thank everybody who you know helped us fuel this this analysis and this work. Um, we got tremendous responses from so many countries. Um, a special shout out to some of the cases, uh, the the top submitting countries, which we really appreciate. We got over a hundred cases from Brazil, which is just amazing. Uh, Fifty three different case studies from Greece, uh, thirty six from Korea, thirty five from Colombia and Turkey, and then you know nineteen uh, to twenty and twenty four from. Uh, Mexico, UAE, UK, Argentina, and Spain as our, as our really top submitting countries, but they really came from uh, all over the world, and, and we've learned a tremendous amount from, from uh, reviewing these cases and, and learning more about what you are all up to. Uh, we are currently in the process of publishing hundreds of these case studies on our case study library. Um, so while a lot of these cases we feature as in-depth cases in our report, um, or at the World Government Summit as part of the edge of government experience. Uh, many also get published on our case study library, which has hundreds of submission or hundreds of different case studies, about 700 right now of different innovations around the world that you can go on to learn more about what other governments are doing uh, and their partners. And to actually, uh, if you have a membership on our website, you can actually reach out to the teams behind them to learn more. Um, the submission window, although we have this annual call for innovations, is always open. We always want to learn more about what you're doing and your innovative activities, so you can always submit a case to us, and we'll continue to review them and publish them on an ongoing basis. And assuming we have another call like this next year, we'll consider that as part of next year's, uh, the cases we see for next year's call. So please uh, always feel free to submit your material to us. We have four primary trends that we're focusing on this year. Um, but uh, I can't quite go into those with you today. We'll be launching these four primary trends at the World Government Summit, um, and we'll be publishing the report there and uh, launching our report on the OPSI website and through our newsletter. So when that launches um, on between 13th and 15th of February, uh, we'll be sharing that on our social media accounts uh, and our, um, on our newsletter. So please subscribe to that to get that the moment it goes out. But what we want to talk about today is four secondary trends that we saw that were almost as uh, as as present, um, but didn't quite uh, capture in the in the four primary trends. But we think that these are 
you know, things that may be primary trends for next year. We saw we we're seeing such a, a um, heavy flow of them. We have public administration transformation, uh, new foundations for youth and intergenerational justice accelerating the path to net zero and strengthening and leveraging GovTech ecosystems and partnerships with the you know, small and innovative startups. Uh, we have four speakers here today that we'll uh, reintroduce in a moment, but today the specific projects we're going to learn about are the ex accelerated capability environment from the United Kingdom's home office. We have future mentors program from the city of Espoo, Finland, a digital, decarbonation, digital decarbonization from Laubar University, and a national AI supercomputing platform from the government of Serbia. Um, we'll dig into these presentations in just a few moments, but before we do, I'd like to pass things over to our project partner, Abir, uh, who has been working with us for years on this project uh, from the UAE's Mohammed bin Rashid Center for Government Innovation. And Abir. Yep. Um, thank you, Jamie. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, thank you for joining the Exploring 2023 Innovation Trends webinar hosted jointly uh, by our partners, um, the OECD, the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation, and of course, the Mohammed Barashid Center for Government Innovation. I am Abir Tahlak, the director of the center, and it's my pleasure, of course, to join you all um, in this evening. Um, we at the Mohammed Barashid Center for Government Innovation, we were established mainly to stimulate and enrich the culture of innovation within, gov within the government sector here in the UAE. So we do this through demonstration projects that open up new possibilities for our government entities. You might have heard of the Ministry of Possibilities or the Government Accelerator Center here at the UAE. So we always aim to generate the multiplier effects that reverberate across the public sector. Um, main, um, the main focus is always fostering a culture that embraces new practices. Um, for example, we have instituted the chief innovation officers in every ministry and work with them to bring about the cultural change across government, all agencies and government here at the UAE. As one of our ministers um, said in Davos recently, our government has been remarkably successful in creating a sense of urgency, even when there isn't one. So, this generates a public sector culture that is constantly striving for improvement and new solutions. This also possesses the challenge um, of how to keep up with the fast pace of change. Uh, we witnessed, you know, by the recent announcements of the new methodology for government and the future proofing of government skills. Uh, this brings me to one of the main pillars of our work here at the center and today's topic um, at this webinar. We call this intelligence. So the importance of not just being on top of national and global trends, but also being able to say, what do they mean for policymakers? Um, how do we make sense of the change that is happening in the public sector around the world? Um, and of course, what does it mean for us here at the UAE? So in the spirit of generating intelligence for public good uh, that we have been collaborating since, Jamie, I think 2016 with the OPSI team, on a global call for government innovations, we are delighted that so many of you contributed your cases and experiences. Um, I would encourage you to continue to do so. And as, as Jamie mentioned, if you haven't, please do. And some of them might be you know, um, 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 considered as, as next year's uh, submissions. Um, so this is the biggest, to my knowledge, global horizon scanning exercise when it comes to public sector innovation. And of course, the report is an opportunity to showcase your work, but also an important um, stock taking exercise for the global public sec sector community. This is why we launch it at the World Government Summit. Um, as mentioned, uh, this year's edition will be between the 13th to the 15th of February here in Dubai. This event is usually attended by more than 4,000 delegates from all over the world, decision makers, policy makers, prime ministers, presidents of countries too. Um, since we, we always like to take a challenge here at the UAE, as some of you already know, we also decided to push the envelope a bit further. Um, we know that some government innovations are not easy to communicate and come across as somewhat too technical for the general public. So this is why we at the World Government Summit organized the Edge of Government, a curated pavilion where we pair up government innovators, people like yourself, 
the, in the audience today and the presenters with designers to translate their innovations into um, compelling interactive experiences that you can touch, feel, and, and interact with. Or interact with. So the aim is, of course, to create that um, emotional as well as a, the intellectual connection that can inspire others to replicate these innovations both locally for us here at the UAE and all over the world for the visitors of, of the summit. Um, so it is an enriching learning experience on all sides and we are very much um, do welcome the opportunity to put the spotlight on other governments work, learn together and help innovators tell their story. Um, you can, of course, learn more about the Edge of Government on our website, edge.worldgovernmentsummit.org, and I'll place it in the chat. Um, and again, once again, in the spirit of the mutual learning, I look forward to finding out more about the projects presented today and continuing this journey of mutual inspiration and collective growth with all of you all together. So thank you. Thank you so much, Abir. And, and you know, this work is really about showcasing the work uh, of the innovators themselves and the people in government that are doing the work to, to really transform um, the way that we're uh, de designing and developing uh, services for citizens, um, responding in new ways, yeah. thinking about new approaches and new ideas. And, and, and in that spirit, I would just like to pass it straight over to our first presentation, uh, which will be Toby Jones, the head of the Accelerated Capability Environment at the United Kingdom Home Office. So uh, over to you, Toby. Hey, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to talk about our team's work and our work with the public sector, private sector, academia here in the UK. So much of what we've just heard about resonates strongly with the experiences that we've had over the last five plus years in really stimulating and energizing a new approach to innovation and thinking about the factors that drive creativity and improvement in public service outcomes. We've learned a lot of experiences. I'm gonna describe some of them today in terms of how we operate. And I look forward to the opportunity to be able to connect with many of you in the future, if you feel too a resonance with some of the ways we've explored this. Thank you. So um, ACE itself is part of the Home Office. We're sponsored by the Home Office and we were stimulated back in 2017 to think differently about how we in the public sector in the UK could really keep up to date and uh, achieve results with contemporary science, technology, digital opportunities and data in, as we've already heard and we're all familiar with, a world where those opportunities and some of the threats that face us change very, very regularly and very quickly. We were concerned that the conventional ways that we were working weren't seizing the opportunity of science, technology, digital and data and pressing those into service quickly enough to achieve results at the front line. Originally, we were considering the value we were uh, achieving from very large scale public sector investment in national capabilities through the Home Office relating to safety and security, police, law enforcement, borders and immigration. But what we found through the model that I'm gonna describe is that our experiences have applied very, very broadly. And really we've gone from startup to scale up in terms of how this capability works. So given that was the challenge ahead of us, what did we do? Uh, we visited uh, the uh, innovation cluster in Boston and a range of other clusters, innovation clusters, where we were very interested to understand what drove the environment we found we were dealing with from a science and technology point of view. What were driving businesses, social behaviors? What were driving the needs of policymakers, of mission delivery partners, the police, healthcare, defense, and others? What were driving their needs and what was stimulating the environment we we're all dealing with? And what we found in Boston and in many other innovation clusters that were creating new technology, science and opportunities was a really close working between, uh, between mission frontline demand signals in the public sector, between academia, startups, investors and venture capital policymakers in a really fluid way a really creative way, certainly a way that we couldn't relate to or accommodate in our conventional ways of working back here in the UK. So what we decided to do uh, was to try and replicate in small form uh, the same types of behaviours, creating a safe place, an imaginative place, an energised place to be able to behave similarly across sectors. And so we put at the heart of what we brought back to the UK and we created the idea that we too should replicate those behaviours as a startup. We should seize the opportunity of creativity and entrepreneurial behavior to drive ideas into impact, delivery, 
uplifts in tools, technology, ways of working, policy at the front line in public service delivery. We should build new trust between organizations and across sectors. We should bring organizations together around problem solving uh, so that ultimately we got the best of what everyone can offer. Because as we all know, and as I often say, you know, most of the brains in the world that are creating the opportunities and solutions and advances we can make are not here in the room with us. They're not in the organization we're in. They're not even in the nation we're in. They're around us globally. And we have to find new ways of bringing organizations together to solve the problems that we face. I'll give you some examples of those towards the end. Of course, pace. We need to move quickly to be able to seize the opportunity of what we can gain from the private sector academia, from civil society organizations, their perspectives and contributions. And we keep focusing on mission results, i.e. the consequence of our work rather than the bureaucracy or arrangements of our work. And we gave that to what effectively was a startup and is a startup sponsored by the Home Office as a business to drive those behaviors and challenge public servants to think differently about how we could achieve this. So how does ACE work itself? Well, number one, we went right to the center of creating a mechanism as a platform to bring together fluidly in an open way and in a constantly evolving way, hundreds of organizations who shared the same passion as us for addressing public good outcomes. And we started with 20 or so organizations in 2017, but very rapidly interest grew. And from the private sector and academia, and from the third sector, the not-for-profit sector, we now have more than 340 organizations who work closely with us, uh, around 80% of whom are small and medium-sized enterprises or academic institutions. And in fact, when I talk about the work that ACE does and has achieved over the last five years, three quarters of the work that we've delivered with this new business model way of working uh, have come from SMEs and academia, which by any conventional measures in the UK is an astounding result. We also brought on board with that uh, dozens, ultimately, of public sector organizations. You can see a few names of those organizations there. But in fact, we've worked with more than uh, four dozen organizations over the last five years uh, to take their problems on and to be able to address those through this mechanism. So how does ACE work? Well, uh, rather a complicated picture, and certainly please refer to our case studies to get more details around this, but I'm going to give you the sort of big handfuls of this. Firstly, everything we do in this business is driven by an agile way of working. So our drumbeat, our MI, the decisions we make, whether it's in delivery, technology, science, external engagement, developing the community that we work with, the commercial arrangements we put in place, is backed off to a stepwise incremental way of working so that we've got frequent opportunity to review our progress and work across the dozens of projects or commissions that we take on and steer our way as we go, bringing in other organizations. Another factor is we're mission led. So that means we don't start a piece of work unless we have a very demanding customer. There's some real needs to advance in terms of the public service outcomes they're achieving. And uh, we also have put in place a range of enabling technologies, for example, commodity cloud secure technology, to be able to securely share data, technology, and IP between organizations so that people can get up close and real with the problems that they're trying to address. Our NCSC, the National Cyber Security Center in the UK, has described that as some of the most secure commodity cloud infrastructure that's available. Why is that important? Because if you're going to build relationships and trust, you have to show that you can work and respect the needs of all of the partners who are engaged. And finally, we work very closely at PACE to make sure we make that step-by-step -step progress towards our goals. So um, what's happened in terms of ACE as a business, as a startup, uh, back in 2017, we delivered a few million pounds worth of work for several organizations. In that time, we were dealing with uh, capabilities that were concerned mainly with our security intelligence agencies and policing. What we found is that over the last five years, the demand signal for our work has increased very steadily. So that we found every year, there's been at least a 20% growth in the volume of work which is coming towards our business in ACE, our ways of working. ACE, by the way, I ought to say, as a business, is not funded by the Home Office on a, a fully budgeted basis. We have to deliver such value to those public sector customers who give us our problems that we can fund our team, our capabilities, our engagements with the community uh, from the work that we do so that we operate fully on a business-like basis. That drives a hunger for a result and a purpose in achieving and making a difference. And it energizes our team while we stay focused on those business public sector outcomes. We have also, because of the, so now in this year, we've just finished delivery of around 40 million pounds worth in the last financial year of commissions. We've about uh, just over 80 commissions delivered in year for 
uh, several dozen public sector organizations. Because of the way that we relate to the world around us and because of the opportunities we provide in lowering the barriers of participation from not just academia, but for the public sector, sorry, private sector and for civil society organizations, we find that they are willing to put resources in to work with us and address our challenges and problems. That's where you see that figure of co-investment arising from. We're actually going to derive more of that. And of course, because of the very wide participation in the IP technology and science that we bring forward and the alternatives that we can pursue, we're able to create a market around supply of new capability into the public sector, which means that when you compare like for like deliveries, uh, we're able to illustrate, as you can see there, for example, in the last five years, more than 10% uh, savings against the, the work that we've delivered. So this business model has really helped us. Let's turn to some practical examples. And these are just a few from the more than 250 commissions that we've delivered. Um, we've applied this platform to the response at the height of the pandemic that the UK government uh, took on to be able to improve our ability to sense and understand the progress of the virus and the interventions we want to make. We now have a world leading capability with VC interest in the IP we translated from academia. We brought sectors together around online activities to provide for assured age assurance, understanding each other's problems and coming up with new standards and be able to work together to assure the safety of children online while they achieve the agency of getting value. We've uh, from uh, the internet and networks. We've intervened in justice for victims, both in modern slavery and ending the violence against women and girls, a massive priority in the UK so that we can bring new technologies to the way that law enforcement, civil society and other organizations work with victims uh, to reduce the harm and to seek perpetrators and justice. Uh, we've also dealt with harm to immigrants crossing into the UK to protect them and to make sure we're aware of risk factors that arise and that we can inject those interventions in our frontline organizations to be able to uh, to make a difference to the well-being and welfare of those who arrive on our shores and many others that you can read about in our case study. The platform's worked well, we'd like to hear from others and connect. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Toby, and that really is a great example of public uh, administration transformation and, and changing the way that we do the business of government. Um, on to the next presentation uh, on the, the subtrend uh, focusing on youth and intergenerational uh, fairness. We have Marianne Jokinen, Development Manager for Citizen Participation, and Vil Leno, Planning Officer for the City of Espoo, Finland. Thank you so much. I'm sharing my screen here. Can you see it? We can see it, but it's not full screen. Um, for me, I can see it's like full screen. Mm. I'm not sure how to. No, no worries. I think. I think you can just uh, walk through them. Okay, okay, yeah, because I see it as full screen, but okay, if you can see them, so <laughs> that's uh, we are really happy to be here to talk about our future mentors program. Uh, I'm Marianne Julkunen, and I'm here today with my colleague Ville Leino, and we are from the city of Espo. And here's a quote from our mayor: "Active and included youth." Uh, is the best asset to a future-proof city. And this quote represents uh, our thinking behind this program. And here you can see the Future Mentors program in a nutshell. Or is it too small now? I can. I looked at Jamie's face and... <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, on, on my side, it has uh, the slide hasn't advanced from the first one. Mm. Ville, can you try to share the screen if I'm doing something wrong here? I'm sorry. I, no, no. I, I see it as full screen. No, I, I, uh, it's easy to get them reversed. Ville, can you try? I can't hear your voice now. Can you hear Ville? Or uh, Marianne, maybe if you share your screen, but just don't go full screen. You can just um, click on the individual slides on the left-hand side, and then we can see them that way. Yeah, just a second. 
Um, what about now? Is it the same problem? Um, I see the, the, the small slides going on the left-hand side. Maybe, uh, do you see those on your screen or is it? Um, no, I see it as, as full size. Ah. Um, yeah, like that. Yeah, now I see the small. Okay. How about you? And then if you click the nutshell slide uh, uh, over on the left, you can continue on like this. We can see, um, we can see your main content. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, in a nutshell, uh, this is a reverse mentoring program in which a small group of young people mentor a decision maker from their own city. And the aim of this program is to bridge the gap between the youth and decision makers on local level and to create dialogue and mutual understanding. And as we know, the values and decisions of today have a long lasting impact on the future of the youth of today. So they should also have a say and a voice in the discussion of these topics. And the mentoring sessions are led by the young future mentors and have a focus on the themes that the youth finds important. The future mentors are given the task to think about their hopes, dreams and fears related to the sustainable future of their home city and then discuss these themes with the mentee. And the mentoring takes place locally. Young people first apply to the program then they conduct a small pre-research among the local youth to get a wider perspective of the hopes and dreams of their local youth. And then they work on their ideas and then have a dialogue about these topics with the decision maker in mentoring sessions. And each city appoints also a coordinator to facilitate the process and support the young mentors. And during our pilot last spring, a, a virtual platform was also created for networking and peer support for the mentors and online mm -hmm. sessions with our sustainable development experts. And uh, the program can be run in one city or also on national or international level. And we, uh, our pilot was on international level. Uh, and this international level adds a wider perspective and peer support to this program. Uh, in our pilot, one mentor from each city traveled to EuroCities conference in Espo at the end of this program to further work on the topics, uh, topics with city leaders and bring youth perspective to the conference. A uh, workshop was also arranged in Espo during the conference and it was dedicated to discussing the topics of the mentoring sessions uh, further. Uh, we asked the city leaders about their thoughts about these topics that were important for the youth and about the balance of power between youth and those already in power and also the, to uh, give their last comment from the decision makers and the youth. And the detailed instructions for running this program on local level are given in the Future Mentors Manual and step-by-step -step guide designed by us. And we also provide communication materials to make this kind of program happen. And the material also includes results from our pilot and any organization is very welcome to use these materials. And uh, here are some numbers from our first round. We had uh, 94 mentors participating, uh, 26 uh, cities from Euro, Euro Cities Network, 26 uh, decision makers, and 26 coordinators. And then Ville, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marianne. I'm just, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. I did some quick fixing while you were talking. So um, during the pilot program, the future mentors talked about their dreams and fears regarding the future of our cities. They worked on these topics locally in a city-specific context. We gathered those topics here in this word cloud, where you can see what they dreamed about in those 26 cities during last spring. As you can see, participation, public transport and housing were amongst the most talked about topics. 
And on this slide, you can see their fears. Uh, as you can see, climate crisis, unemployment, inequality, and poverty, they are just some things that cause worry amongst the mentors. Uh, during the Eurocities conference in Espo, we asked the mentors who took part in the conference to form five key recommendations on how to involve young people at local level. Uh, as you can see, however, when they came on the stage, they presented six recommendations as they felt that five was not enough. Uh, I think this just goes to show how young people don't always want to fit in the boundaries we set them in. And personally, I love, love their approach to this as the thing. So their suggestions were compulsory and non-tokenistic youth engagement in decisions which affect them. They wanted to create a youth department for university so that young people are always part of the university's network. Uh, they demanded a regular at least two times a year communication between city leaders and youth representatives uh, and the inclusive and accessible engagement with young people with extra care to include those from disadvantaged backgrounds. They also wanted enough resources to support youth centered organizations and finally constant evaluation and gathering of feedback. We polled the people taking part in the program and here you can see their feedback in numbers. As you can see, both the mentors and mentees were fairly happy on how the program was executed and felt that it's a good way to involve young people in the decision making. And here's some written feedback from the mentors. The program was praised for its low threshold of participation and possibilities it offers for young people to have a say. However, as participation methods differ between cities and countries, some participants felt that the topics brought up during the program were not very groundbreaking for them personally. We also asked our mentees for some feedback. They felt that the program was an effective way to give young people a voice in the decision-making process. They also felt that the dialogue during the program was very positive and respectful. But of course, the real value comes from the impact of the dialogues. And so on this slide, we can see some of the impact the future mentors has already had. So far, the program has led to, for example, an establishment of the Youth Council. The future mentors are still in contact regularly with each other. And 93% of participating cities would like to collaborate within Eurocities on youth participation. Future Mentors program was also shortlisted for Finnish National Education Agency's Best Youth Participation Practices for last year. And in the feedback, uh, the program was praised for the fact that the themes are decided by the young participants themselves. As we already mentioned, all material needed for running the program is freely available and ready to be used. And at least one city has already organized a program after our pilots. And as a bonus, you can check out the recording of our youth participation event in Brussels held earlier. A panel discussion with three future mentors was arranged at the event. And this concludes our part. It's been a pleasure to share this information with you. Uh, remember that you can always contact me or Marianne in anything regarding this program. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you so much, Marianne and Ville. I, I really love the, the concept of, of turning mentorship on its head and bringing in these young people to help uh, help decision makers really learn what's important to them. It's a fascinating approach. Um, and thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, up next, uh, we have a presentation on digital decarbonization uh, from Professor Thomas Jackson, uh, for uh, Professor of Information and Knowledge Management and Ian Hodgkinson, Hodgkinson, a professor and chair in strategy at Lauberhoe University. Uh, so I'll pass that over to you, professors uh, Jackson and Hodgkinson. Thanks very much, Jamie. Good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Uh, as Jamie says, uh, we're two professors from the School of Business and Economics at uh, Loughborough University. Uh, I'm going to talk about data decarbonization. You're probably thinking, oh, that's a, a mouthful. What's that about? Well, last year, we started to think around, does data have a carbon footprint? We're surrounded by data all the time. And what impact is that having on the planet? So 
So you've probably seen this uh, diagram many times before, but on the right hand side, there's a graphic that shows what's going on around the globe every minute. So you can see the huge volume of data that's being generated. And this is just in the social media sphere, let alone you think about financial banking in public sector, et cetera, how much data is being generated all the time. So we, we expect seven, nearly 80 zettabytes of data uh, to be generated by the Internet of Things. So everything has a chip. Everything wants to connect to the cloud. Uh, we're storing all this data. We know the latest Audi cars have 22, I think it's 22 SIM cards collecting data all the time. The problem is this data has to go somewhere. So it goes into a cloud. And we know when we look at data centers, which is effectively the cloud, the carbon footprint of a data center is around 3% of global carbon emissions. So that is worse than the aviation industry. So what we're seeing then is we know data is doubling every two years, and yet we're talking about um, saving the planet, and there's obviously some things that are right in front of us that we need to try and solve now, but you can look at data and the way we um, interact with data and the way we store data as this iceberg that's looming towards us. So if we don't do something about it now, when we get to that actual iceberg, it might be too, too late. Ian. So not only is data growing rapidly, we also need to think about the digital data practices of organisations. And so one negative practice is the duplication of data that we see in the workplace. Our estimates would suggest that this is actually much higher for public organisations, in part given the huge digitalization efforts of public administrations, which includes migration to the cloud and this approach of store it all. It has been successful. However, that store it all approach and the sheer volume of historic data, new data being created, processed, stored, it often is forgotten. And these are things which presents a significant challenge to net zero efforts. So in the public sector, we often see a great deal of silo working where workers are not clear on what others are doing necessarily. There can be a lack of inter-service and inter-departmental working, often due to the, the structural constraints uh, in many public sector organizations. But also we see growing demands on the time of public sector personnel, which means that often it's easier and quicker for those individuals to generate new data rather than trace what already exists for the reuse of that information. So rather than seeing reuse of data, reuse of information, we are tending to see more and more new data being generated while all that old data remains and is stored uh, and saps uh, power and energy. And these are some of the reasons why we see a large amount of data duplication in the sector. And what this does, it carries a significant cumulative consequence for the data CO2 footprint. Tom? Thanks, Ian. So if it's new to you for the first time, it's sometimes a little bit hard to get your, your head around this. So we're creating all this data, it's going into a data warehouse, so what? But we know the carbon emissions are gonna grow all the time because of the volume of data is growing all the time. We know uh, data warehouses are really good in terms of they're trying to improve the efficiency of the CPUs and put solar panel on their, on their warehouses and try and improve the cooling systems, but it's still, a massive issue and we can't just look for the data warehouses to try and solve our energy issue in terms of our carbon output so here's the real the crux of the problem out of all the data we store 65 percent of that data is known as dark data so that's data that's used once or never at all so you can see that comes from the internet of things or the sensors that we're bringing in all this lovely data that we think we need and you know, most of the time it's not actually used. And then you've got 15% on top of that within the data warehouse that is out of date data. So it's poor information governance. Now within the, the, the public sector, you think we probably have very good information governance, but wouldn't it be nice to do an audit on the organization to find out how good we are actually at our information governance, how much dark data we have, how much is redundant and out of date data. So we've been working uh, with a national physical laboratory to come up with a measurement, an agreed measurement that can be used globally 
so governments can put it into their policy because we talk a lot about co2 emissions and it is in a lot of government uh, policy but it's not within policies that contain data so we haven't got data content or data emissions uh carbon emissions within uh, government policies i don't think anywhere in the world so to try and put this in to context then so if we have a hundred employees uh and they're working away normally maybe in the financial sector there's lots of data working for 12 months the amount of data they generate is the equivalent of flying from london to new york 2562 times a year so you know when you've got your mobile phone and you're looking at your photos and it goes into google photos or it goes into your icloud and we forget about those photos that also has a carbon footprint every email you send which has lots of metadata has a huge carbon footprint so we need to start thinking about if we're going to do lots of artificial intelligence and we're going to do lots of reports what's the minimum viable data set we can use to try and save these carbon emissions so we can try and reduce how much we actually put into these big data warehouses and i love the quote from the chief secretary uh, of the united nations we're on a highway to climate hell with our foot on the accelerator and i think most people don't realize actually data is going to be the big big issue in a few years to come so the good thing that ian's going to talk about in a minute is the data carbon ladder we've started to use this and toby will be very pleased with this on an ace project recently so we're actually putting this into practice to see if we can actually make a difference over to ian so we have two complementary approaches which we encourage public administration service organizations as well as organizations in the private and third sectors as well the first is a more reactive approach mapping the landscape mapping the data landscape identifying co2 hotspots in terms of where is it collecting where is it gathering where are the bottlenecks now we'd say that's reactive because it's looking at the existing data sets that's really important to determining what can be done now with the current stocks of data that we have and making them more efficient and better for the environment the carbon ladder that Tom's talking about is a much more proactive approach. It's the first in the world to exist. And this takes data from the uh, origin of that data right through the data journey to end user use. And the aim here is to help organizations address this really complex matter through a step-by-step -step process that diagnoses the different stages that data goes through in terms of its collection, its processing, its use and its storage and helping organizations ask the right questions. And some of the key questions will be, what is the minimum viable data set that we need to address the tasks that we are facing or to manage the requests that we have? And often these types of questions aren't asked because organizations assume that data is carbon neutral, but it's not. But thankfully there is a solution, something which we're very excited about and hopefully can take us further forward with many other types of organizations in the future and that wraps us up just about on time jamie thank you well thank you uh very much professor jackson and professor hodgkinson i know that within the the team here at the oecd we uh this this particular case was extremely thought-provoking to us and uh especially in how we uh you know just carry out our own activities and, and think about these uh different uh Kind of carbon microaggressions with every email that we send and the hacks that we have that's duplicating data all over our OECD servers and uh, so I think it's got, uh, caused us to rethink some of the way we do things but thank you very much for that presentation uh, and on to the last presentation we have uh, coming from the government of Serbia to discuss their AI supercomputing platform Tamara Korsic advisor for the Office of Information Technology and e-government and Bogdan Stesevic manager of the National AI Platform. So over to you. Unmute. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Tamara Korsic uh, from the Office for IT and the Government of uh, Serbia. Uh, thank you for recognizing our uh, national AI platform as one of uh, the best uh, practices, uh, as well as for this wonderful opportunity to hear uh, about other inspiring initiatives. Um, 
Um, I just want to give you a bit of context. Uh, the tech uh, revolution in Serbia uh, started uh, back in 2017 uh, with uh, Anna Brnovic as the prime minister. Uh, in her keynote address, uh, she said that uh, we were in the exciting uh, uh, early stages of the industrial revolution, which uh, gives Serbia and other countries the chance to succeed, uh, even though we were unable to uh, capitalize uh, on the third. Uh, she then set out a shift from labor intensive to knowledge and innovation driven economy as the goal of her government. And she said, uh, new, uh, she saw uh, technology as the engine of that shift. Uh, Fast forward uh, uh, five years and today uh, ICT sector is the largest uh, net uh, exporting sector in Serbia and every second job created last year uh, was uh, in the ICT sector. Uh, special focus was uh, placed on GovTech. In 2022, Serbia was one of the top 10 countries with the highest progress made in e-government, according to United Nations uh, e-government development index, as well as the fourth uh, in Europe and 11th in the world, according to the World Bank uh, GovTech maturity index. Um, however, uh, it is uh, important to say that uh, throughout history, uh, many brilliant Serbian minds, such as uh, Nikola Tesla, had to develop their ideas elsewhere because uh, in the past, uh, Serbia lacked the infrastructure and the supportive environment. So we understood that we have to change that. Um, and as a result of the focus of our government and the investments being made, uh, we can now uh, proudly say that uh, great technology and innovation ecosystem is in place. Uh, today, our startups are real drivers of innovation in our country. Their significance is recognized. And our goal is to no longer have a single startup in Serbia that does not have access to uh, necessary infrastructure, uh, finances, uh, professional support. Uh, thank you. I will now uh, give the floor to my colleague uh, Bogdan Stešević, uh, manager of National AI Platform. Thank you. Tamara will slide away. Uh, so, good morning, uh, good afternoon, actually. Uh, my name is Bogdan, and I am uh, very pleased to have this opportunity to talk with you about uh, one of our uh, major pillars uh, of our uh, transformation for uh, innovation driven uh, economy, and that is artificial intelligence. Uh, so Serbia today has already have a relatively uh, developed uh, ecosystem of AI. Uh, we established uh, in 2019 our national AI strategy. And by that, we are first country in Southeastern Europe and 26th uh, country in the world to adopt an AI strategy. Uh, alongside that, we also uh, established in 2021 uh, AI Institute. And, uh, and AI Institute is... Uh, R&D organization to help uh, to navigate these uh, new exciting developments in various fields. Uh, they work in computer vision, uh, NLP, green AI, AI in healthcare also, and the uh, institute uh, gathers more than 40 uh, researchers and young talents. Uh, and many of them are Serbian origins that returned to Serbia after working for the biggest IT companies. Uh, US in United uh, States, in, in Western Europe, usually. So, um, belong, uh, and uh, also the National Science and, and Innovation uh, Funds are supporting uh, uh, numerous AI R&D programs, uh, in, uh, uh, companies, also startups. And uh, Serbia is one of the 11 countries in the world that has uh, artificial intelligence program uh, implemented in primary and secondary education. So uh, we have uh, now five master uh, in, uh, in AI, uh, and this year we will have seven of them. So uh, we have also sev uh, several successful uh, impl implementation of AI in the public sector, uh, specifically in the energy and health domains, because that's uh, very uh, hot topics these days. So uh, uh, data science and AI uh, subjects are included in the program uh, of the national uh, Academy for Public Administration, and uh, they are available to civil service. Uh, so, although there are more interesting 
developments of these kinds, uh, but now I will concentrate on uh, AI infrastructure, which is basically my job in government office. Uh, so in uh, 2020, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the government of Serbia opened the doors of the state data center in the city of Kragujevac, uh, which is one of the largest and most uh, sophisticated data centers in the Southeastern Europe. Uh, the data center now became the home of our national AI platform. Uh, we all know that development uh, of AI products requires compute, uh, computational infrastructure, which is uh, usually very expensive and uh, really not easy to uh, assess. Uh, it's really not accessible uh, that easy. So a uh, need for national AI platform has been recognized uh, as a key uh, enabler, and the government decided to set uh, to set up a supercomputer. You can see in this slide. So uh, this supercomputer is. Uh, NVIDIA-based cluster and has been installed uh, in December of 2021 uh, with addition of data science software uh, called FMLE uh, Fast Machine Learning Engine, and uh, which is basically uh, the GUI that simplifies the use of AI platform, uh, its computational resources, managing data, and the whole workflow. Uh, the first user of our AI platform was the AI Institute. Uh, they are already working with industry partners, with multinational companies like uh, Continental, uh, NCR, uh, Takeda, and several more. So, uh, and for all of their projects, they are using our national uh, AI platform. So, on to next slide. Uh, well, uh, however, uh, to be able to make uh, the best use of the platform, uh, the government made really a fantastic uh, decision to make the platform available free of charge uh, to all stakeholders of the Serbian AI uh, ecosystem. Uh, and this is why in March of 2022, we launched public call for startups and all of our uh, domestic startups had the chance to uh, apply. Uh, the best startups were uh, selected through a scoring system. Uh, their idea, product, solution was the most important criteria for us uh, for selection of them. Uh, and because uh, the, the, if you know, you probably know that uh, if you are a startup company, uh, it, is, uh, it's, it is every single euro that counts. So, uh, for example, for uh, relatively small projects to be uh, hosted on some commercial cloud AI platform like, like uh, Google, Oracle, or I don't know, uh, Amazon, it takes up to 10 or even 20,000 euros, and it represents a really big barrier for them. So uh, this is why uh, the opportunity to use our national AI platform completely for free is really uh, represent for them a really big boost for these companies. Um, Currently, at this moment, uh, we have 24 institutions on AI platform, of which nine faculties, six institutes, four science technology parks, and also 19 startup companies. So the Office uh, uh, for e-government, uh, which is in charge of, of uh, uh, platform, is established a dedicated team to administer the platform, to manage all the user accounts, uh, to install all necessary environments and tools, and also to give the technical support to uh, users on a daily basis. Uh, and with more than 200 uh, user accounts uh, on a platform, we really hope that uh, many exciting projects are being cooked right now. So uh, now I will give my colleague Tamara the floor to conclude our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Bogdan. Um, another round of public call for startups will be launched uh, in the second quarter of this year. Of course, uh, all of them uh, will receive theoretical and hands-on uh, trainings like the already supported startups. Uh, we are aware that the interest uh, in the platform is really great and um, we are happy to include more. Uh, what is also very important for us is the further fostering of the AI and uh, GovTech ecosystem through collaboration. Uh, Serbia became a member of Euro HPC last year, which gives us the opportunity to, to learn from good uh, practices from peers uh, all over Europe. 
just recently, we became a member of the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence, uh, GPAI, uh, which we also hope to help us uh, build the partnerships around AI. Uh, this year, uh, we will be joining the Digital Euro program, uh, and we have already arranged with our partners from GovTech for All uh, Consortia to work jointly on GovTech projects. Uh, also, in cooperation with the uh, GIZ and the World Bank, we are soon launching the uh, GovTech program as a sustainable system of innovation in the public sector through cooperation with uh, innovative companies, uh, universities, startups. Um, also, Innovation Fund of Serbia is about to launch uh, a dedicated grant competition for GovTech startups. And um, finally, uh, we cherish our uh, bilateral partnerships in the domains of AI and GovTech with uh, several countries. Uh, United uh, Arab uh, Emirates uh, being the one with which our collaboration is the most advanced. Um, and uh, with uh, that being said, um, I want to thank OECD and the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation for being such a fantastic platform for learning and knowledge sharing. Uh, and as I always like to say, there is one thing that increases when it's shared and uh, that is knowledge. Uh, we are looking forward to the new report on the latest uh, trends on public sector innovation to be launched, uh, I believe during the World Government Summit. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tamara and Bogdan. Uh, we really appreciate the presentation. Uh, I think this is a really unique project. I, I love when government can be uh, serve as a platform for, um, you know, the, the to create public sector innovations on top of, but then also catalyzing economic development in the private sector. I, the, the placement of the presentations of uh, digital decarbonization and the AI platform right next to each other was inadvertent, but I think it really helps to, you know, the, the, this innovation helps, you know, try to consolidate and make things more efficient by other people and, and businesses leveraging the supercomputing power of the government rather than all going off and spinning off their own uh, data centers or own their uh, and, and server hosting and all that stuff. So I think that this maybe even uh, helps to reduce that uh, uh, carbon footprint a bit. But thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I, in the chat, we've added some links to the various different case studies and websites. Um, and uh, uh, so, but in the, in, for the sake of time, I don't wanna keep folks further. We really appreciate everyone coming out to join us today. Um, as we mentioned, uh, the full 23, excuse me, 2023 Innovation Trends Report will be published at the World Government Summit uh, during between uh, February 13th to 15th. We don't have the exact date nailed down yet, but if you subscribe to our newsletter or follow our social media um, feeds on LinkedIn or Twitter, we'll be uh, announcing that uh, live through there and then probably also doing some live tweeting of uh, a discussion session that we'll be holding at the event. Um, we do have some questions in the chat. There were many that were already addressed by the speakers themselves. Thank you very much for that. We're also going to take note of the ones that we didn't quite get to, and we'll send out an email after this as a bit of a recap, uh, maybe a link to the video, and then some answers to the to the questions. So we'll take these down. Uh, but thank you very much. And we really appreciate uh, everybody joining and, and speakers. Thank you so much for providing valuable insights to this work. These are really incredible innovations and projects, and, and I hope that our participants and audience today um, have some takeaways and, and things to think about as they uh, as they you know, carry out their own work in their own governments. But um, thank you all so much. And I hope you all have a great day. And uh, we'll, we'll let, uh, be in touch in February. Have a good day, everybody.